and welcome to Bandwidth Conversations, a podcast that finds out about the stories and journeys of artists, performers, and rock stars of life. I am Katie Brewer, and today I am talking to one of my favorite people and a total rock star. She is a number one best selling author on the Sunday Times bestsellers list, and each and every book she publishes immediately shoots into the top 10. In fact, normally into the top five. She writes sweeping sagas of love, tragedy, trauma, heartbreak, and hope. Her first novel was published in 2001, and since then she has written 27 books. That's more than one every year. She has sold over 6 million copies worldwide. She is also one of the fastest skiers around, following her father and other family members who completed at Olympic level. Her uncle did that famous James Bond jump off a cliff in The Spy Who Loved Me. She's a linguist. She's universally admired and loved. She's talented yet humble, hilarious, inspiring, loyal, and supremely approachable. A friend of hers recently said of her, she is a candidate for sainthood as a mother, sister, godmother, and wife, but somehow also one of the funniest people in London. So you might very well understand why I am so thrilled that my guest today is Santa Montefiore. Hello, Santa. Well, that's one hell of a write-up. <laughs> <laughs> I love being called a rock star. <laughs> so Santa, you grew up on a farm in Hampshire. Yeah. And how would you characterize your childhood? Uh, idyllic. Looking at the way children are brought up nowadays, I was so incredibly lucky to live on a farm with endless fields and woods, a pond where we used to make rafts, rather like Swallows and Amazons. That was the book that we all loved and wanted to be like them. And so daddy always made us out of big cans that were from the farm. They were empty and he'd make a raft and then we'd he'd make a little house out of hay bales called Christmas Cottage for some reason. And every year, you know, we'd do something different, but we'd be building, we'd be creating, we'd be pottering around in the woods. And my parents never worried where we were. Nobody ever called us for a meal. We just turned up when we were hungry and we had enormous freedom. And I think children nowadays don't get that. It's a Jacobean house. There were coins from Henry VIII's era actually wow. found in the fireplace in the hall. It started off as a sort of small farmhouse and it's been built over the years and added on to. So it's a really substantial house now. But back in the day, I think when it was built, it was just a really small cottage probably. But it's got wonderful gardens and it's idyllic. It's a little corner of paradise. And most of my novels are rooted in that even though the house might not look the same as my house, I have Georgian houses and Italian palazzos, but the feel of home and how important and special home is, is always at the heart of my novels. I need nature, really, for my characters to really express themselves. And certainly the way I write a book, I have to love what I'm writing. I have to sort of be carried on a wave of inspiration and enthusiasm. In fact, Ralph Waldo Emerson said, nothing great has ever been achieved without enthusiasm. And I know That's exactly true. what he means, because when you feel that rush of enthusiasm, you tap into something higher than you and you... Right. You know, you write something that's special. You were quite young when you started writing stories. Yeah, I always think, certainly with people who seem to have a vocation creatively, like they're a painter or a musician, it's something that they bring into the world with them. I was always writing children's stories, very much based on the stories that I read as a child, like Alice and Utley, the little grey rabbit stories, and Winnie the Pooh, so Wind of the Willows. So I wrote about animals, usually hedgehogs and rabbits, and i do the drawings myself. It, I could spend hours doing that. Then I wrote little stories for my friends at school. And then when I got into my early 20s, I was writing love stories. So I was always writing for me. I was never thinking of writing for anybody else. I just did it for my own entertainment. But I would definitely say that it's something that's always been in me. And I'm never happier than when I'm in the middle of a project. And then when you left school, you went to Argentina. And what was that like? Well, I'd always loved Latin American music. I'd always think I th it was in me. My mother was born and brought up in Argentina. Then the family moved to Brazil when she was about eight years old, I think. But Argentina was in my blood even before I went there. My cousins would come over and I'd listen to them speaking Spanish and I really wanted to learn it. And I learned it at school. 
My brother and sister had no interest in Latin America at all. It was just a part of me. And I recognized that. And when I arrived in Buenos Aires, I got off the plane, took a deep breath, probably a lot of diesel. And <laughs> <laughs> but I thought, I'm home. I'm home. I just felt Straight it. The away, minute, yes, was there was something feeling. about it. I just knew I'd arrived home. I had the best year of my life. I lived with this amazing family, a man called Santi Soldati and his wife Eva, who's Finnish. And they had three small children who are now very grown up children with children of their own. Makes me feel really old. I feel like a granny. And I taught them English. Uh, they were about three, six, and seven. They must have loved you. Oh, well, they treated me really badly for the first oh. few weeks, actually. They had this amazing farm and each member of the family, they're about five brothers and sisters, each have a house on the farm and they each had about five children each. So it was a huge gang of young people. They had polo fields, they all shared the swimming pool, the tennis court, and all the kids would hang out together. There'd be barbecues at a different house every night and everybody would go to each other's houses and things on horseback. It was just oh gosh, such a wonderful lovely. lifestyle that I'd never experienced anything like it. You know, just get on a horse and go and have tea with, you know, a neighbour and then ride back again at sunset. It was just so beautiful. But the children were really wild until I realised I had to just be rather strict with them because I was such a people pleaser. I was running around pushing one on the spot. Um, swing, <laughs> finding conkers with another one, playing something else with another one. I was kind of trying to be everything to all people. The minute I told them off and started being strict with them, they loved me. So it just goes to show, actually, with one's own children that children do need boundaries and they kind of like, they feel secure when they know where they stand. So yeah, those three children now are grown up, but I learned Spanish. The minute I arrived on the farm, Eva Soldati said to me, listen, you can have a fling with any of my nephews, but don't go near Miguel. He has a girlfriend in every corner of Buenos Aires and he's very attractive, but he's not gonna be right for you. So leave him at bay. So anyway, I thought, fine, there are lots of other delicious men here. And they were all so gorgeous and suntanned and they all have sort of wonderful green eyes. And I mean, they're very, people think when you think of South America, very dark, but actually the Argentines are quite fair. And there are a lot of German, Swedish, you know, Scandinavians. Um, it's a real melting pot. And so they're quite uniquely gorgeous, actually, I'd say the Argentine men. And I saw Miguel and didn't think he was attractive at all. So I talked to him because the others were so scary because they were so charismatic and gorgeous and turned out that he was the most dangerous of them all by far. And he was the one that I had a fling with for about six months, but it was fabulous fun. And he was terrible and treated me so badly. And I loved every minute of it. As soon as someone says you shouldn't be with somebody, then they immediately become more attractive. Yes, but funny enough, actually, that didn't happen with him because I looked at him and thought, well, Eva's barking. I wouldn't want to be with him. He comes up to my shoulder for a start. You know, he's That's not so very funny. tall and he just wasn't very attractive, but he was really sexy. He had extraordinary charisma and, oh dear. I mean, if I read over my diary of that year, mind you, he has, isn't, he's not in any of my novels. I think you don't put people in their entirety in your novel. One does sort of steer clear of that. But I think the energy, you do put people's energy and Most your experiences, elements. yes, and elements of somebody. So there's definitely Miguel in many different shapes or forms probably is in my novels. I mean, he died, sadly, in his 40s. So I'd like to think that there is a bit of Miguel in many of my heroes. He was a wonderful character. Well, it must have been really, really hard to come back to the UK after a year like that. Yeah. Because so you, you went then to, to Exeter to do Well, it was hard Spanish coming back because I was quite fat. Uh. Um, so... <laughs> I'd eaten so much dulce de leche and the father had hives, beehives on the farm and had these big bottles, wine bottles full of honey. And I just had an obsession with this honey. And when I got back to England, you know, after a year away, you want to be different. You want everybody to look at you and go, oh my God, she's flowered. She's blossomed. She's been away. Yeah. Have you seen Santa? She's gorgeous. <laughs> no, no. I think they were saying, have you seen Santa? She's it's so enormous. fat. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have a lot more of her now. Anyway, so I had to really slightly pull it together when I got back. So I didn't really realise how fat I was. And now when I look back at photos and I see how fat I was, I'm kind of appalled actually. But yes, it was hard coming back. I think I was very annoying because I did that really annoying thing that I find annoying in other people where I would say, oh, 
do you want to, ay, como se dice en inglés, uh, do you want to go out tonight? <laughs> and it's like, that is so annoying, you're English. Why are you, you know, and doing that whole thing of, eh, no, eh, you know, that's sort of trying to be Argentine. It's like, leave it over there, you know, you're English. But I wanted to hold on to it. So I was so proud of that I'd lived in Argentina. I didn't really enjoy Exeter, to be honest. I wanted to get back to Argentina. I really didn't want to be in an institution. I'd been out in the world for a year, so it was quite hard. But I, you know, I got a lot out of it in the end. I got a degree. <laughs> I then came and lived in London and then life took off for me. I mean, I'd been going out with this Argentine for two and a half years. Miguel stayed in Argentina. I never went out with him. It was just a sort of flirtation for about six months. No, Christian, I did go out with Christian for two and a half years, very officially. And he died too. He died of oh, COVID. Oh gosh, Santa. I know, I'm beginning to think I have a sort of, you kiss me and you don't live very long. <laughs> Anyway, it's very sad. I know. So, But I went out with him for two and a half years. And then when I split up with him and moved to London and started working, I became a new person. It was amazing. It was the freedom of living in a flat with my brother in London. It was fab. And what did you do? I worked at the General Trading Company. That doesn't exist anymore, the General Trading Company. No, but I remember it. Yeah. So I was there in the decorative living department, selling cash pays and lampshades and things. I loved it. People would come in and chat me up and I'd go out on dates. And yeah, that London in those days was really fun. So you weren't at that point thinking of writing. You'd sort of put that yes, on the back no, burner no, no. for a bit. No, no, no. I was always writing. Even in Argentina, I was writing. I wrote a children's book, actually, for the three children I looked after with all the paintings and oh everything that they goodness. still have. Yeah. No, I was always writing. It was the one thing I always did, but I never thought I would be a published writer. It didn't occur to me. It was like, you know, the moon's up there. It's a beautiful moon. I'm never going to go up there. I don't mind. It was like that, writing, I'd see books in the bookshops and I would never think that mine would ever be there or should ever be there or that I'd ever write a book that would be published at all. And it didn't bother me because it just wasn't in my realm of expectation. So I was very happy going along writing my books. Never occurred to me to get something published. I mean, I did send a very bad Mills and Boone style skiing love story off to Mills and Boone that got rejected. And I did send a children's book to Harper Collins that got rejected. And how did you feel about those rejections? Didn't mind, didn't mind. Not really, because I didn't expect it to happen. It wasn't until I was 25, 26, going out with my husband, Seabag, who himself was a journalist at that point, and also he'd written a book himself. So he was wanting to be a writer as well. And he said, why don't you try and get a book published? And then, until that point, I actually hadn't thought about it. So the book I was writing at that point was based on my year in Argentina. It's a big story, an allegory of my love affair with Argentina, really. It's two people who love each other, grow up together in Argentina, love each other, leave each other and come back years later and try and rekindle their old love through an affair and to recapture the past through an affair. But it was my first book and I sent that off to three agents and that then I did mind. I got rejected very quickly. In fact, I think I sent it to four. Three rejected me outright very fast. And that was devastating because I was working at Ralph Lauren at the time. I didn't want to be in that sort of job forever. Those sort of jobs for me, I worked at Theo Fennell, which I absolutely adored. I loved working with people and working as a team with people. And that was all fun. But I couldn't see myself doing that in 20 years time. I wasn't a businesswoman. At that point, when I got those rejections, I thought that's a door closing. It was a door I never really knew was there, but once yeah. I knew it was there and then it closed, I was really devastated actually about those three rejections and couldn't quite understand it because I thought the book was brilliant. So I couldn't understand why they didn't want it. Like, How long had it taken you to write it? Probably three, two, three years. Okay. I'd been working on it, but weekends, holidays, not, not sort of very intensively. Yeah. And then about three months later, I'd forgotten all about the fourth agent and Joe Frank at AP Watt came back and said, I love it, but it's not right but I can work on it with you. And together we did. We worked on it, added another 50,000 words. And then I sat in my beautiful office, judged by the Ralph Lauren creative department <laughs> with the orchid and the leather chair looking out over the London eye. And we'd moved to the new Bond Street store and they didn't really know what they wanted to do with me. And while they were deciding what they wanted me to do, I sat in their office and wrote the extra 50,000 words that Joe needed me to write. Then she sent it off to publishers and I got a deal with Hodron Stoughton and handed him 
my notice at Ralph Lauren. But actually, those six months working at Ralph Lauren, for me, were kind of crucial because I sat in my office looking like I was doing a lot of work and but being were, really but busy. But not for them. Not for them. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, I am wearing Ralph Lauren jeans today and a sweater. And a jumper. <laughs> actually, so I'm still flying the flag. <laughs> When I got the book published, Seabag said, at that point we were married, and he said, if they paid me more than my salary was paying me, then it'd be worth leaving. And they did. So then I left. When you were working with the agent and she came back and said, I need 50,000 more words, was that structure? Was that character? No, I tell you exactly what it was. The story at that point was about Santi and Sophia, and she wanted me to go into the other characters. So there was Sophia's parents who were very key, but we didn't really know anything about them. So I went back into their past, the mother's past in Ireland. And actually that was really fun because there's one thing working on stuff that you've already written, which is okay. But if you're writing new stuff, then it becomes really fun because then you're creating something new. So I rather enjoyed doing that. So it was really just expanding. She said, this is a story about two people because I saw it like a Bridges of Madison County. That's what I was basing it on. Whereas she saw the Thornbirds. She wanted a much bigger story with going into the uncles and the aunts and the cousins and going into the world much more. And as soon as she said, I love it, and this is where I see it going, I was so fired up with enthusiasm that I just threw myself into it. You know, and then you produce something that's really good because somebody believes in you. Yes. And it was the first one of yours that I read and I absolutely loved it. And Anna, my daughter, is desperate to go to Argentina as a result of it. It's top of her list of destinations. Straight away after that, you write The Butterfly Box. Box. And how long did that take you to write? Very quick. I literally wrote that in about four months. And that is even longer than the Ombu. Those two are very long. Because I gave up my job. I had no children. I went down to the countryside to my parents' house and I just shut myself away in the drawing room, put on the fire, put on some music. Music is key to me. Lit a candle and just threw myself into it. And it just flowed. I think I had, you know, when I think of the amount of books I've written over the years, I think I've just got so much in there that's wanting to come out. It was like opening a door and just letting it all go. You have to be very disciplined to be a writer. So how do you manage your day? Every book is different. Enthusiasm, again, I keep repeating that word, but if you are enthusiastic about what you're writing, you can't wait to get back to it. So it becomes like an itch. You just have to scratch the whole time. If it's not, then there's something wrong and I need to go back and say, okay, why aren't I inspired with this book? What's going wrong? To be honest, I really haven't had that very much. I wrote two books last year because of lockdown and I was massively inspired by both of those. And because of lockdown, I had nothing else on. So then you get very into your book because you've got no distractions. What's very hard is when you start it and then you've got a few days when you're busy doing other stuff because going back to it is very difficult. If you're doing it every day and it's constant, it's very easy because you're just continuing every day from where you left off the day before. There's no big break to take you out of it. So you do have to be disciplined though. I really do need about five hours a day. If I can sit down at 10 o'clock, I have to walk the dog and things like that first. But if I'm at my desk at 10 then I pretty much want to be there till about five. And I'll eat at my desk. you turn your phone off? You do, does everything go? Yeah, yeah, I try not to read the Daily Mail online while I'm <laughs> <laughs> writing my book. I sometimes get a little tempted and something will flash <laughs> off and I'll go, oh, look at that. But actually you do have to really kind of get in the zone. You need breaks too, though, because you can get quite tired. But music helps massively because that gets me into the zone. And I always have a playlist And there's a wonderful song that I've just started my new book. And my son was playing this sad, sad song or piece of music. And anyway, it's called Oogwe Ascends. I love the word Oogwe. Oogwe. So I've put Oogwe Ascends on a loop. I've got about 20 Oogwe Ascends on my playlist. (laughs) And it's actually from Kung Fu Panda. Oh, is it? It is. It's from the cartoon. I know. And Kung Fu Panda is absolutely brilliant. And there's that fantastic quote in Kung Fu Panda, which clearly didn't come from Kung Fu Panda, but it's um, the past is history, yes. the future a mystery. Today is a gift, which is why it's called the present. Exactly. So yes. wise, wise film. Wise film <laughs> and beautiful music. I think it's Hans Zimmer, but he's wonderful. So I listen to all his, usually they're all his, um, all John Barry's playlists. And the book that you had talked about that you wrote in lockdown, that was Flappy Entertains, which again was a departure from 
your other books because it was a it's a comedy. The flappy one, I just wanted to write something funny because everything was so miserable. And every time you open the newspapers or listen to the news, it was just so scary. And everybody was rather anxious, of course. And I thought I want to do something to make my readers happy and to give them a good laugh. And in one of my books called The Temptation of Gracie, there's this character called Flappy Scott Booth, who's very pretentious and upwardly mobile and really ghastly, actually. And yet I got lots of emails saying, oh, I loved Flappy. She had such a small part, though. And I wanted to give her her own book. And I discussed it with my agent. And she said, well, the trouble is your readers will want a big book every year. So if you give them a flappy, they'll be disappointed. So I didn't have time to write a flappy book until lockdown, which gave me the perfect opportunity because I had nothing else to do. So I wrote flappy, got very into it and very inspired and thought it was hilarious and got my mother to read it and my sister-in-law to read it as well. And they loved it, actually. Uh, my mother knows quite a few flappies, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she knows a woman called Flappy, who I have to say is nothing to do with my Flappy. Just they have the same name. And I obviously subconsciously used her name because where else would I get Flappy from? But I definitely, she's beautiful and elegant and lovely. So I wouldn't have used her. But I obviously stole her name. But so Flappy, yes, Flappy, it was a bit of a gamble because I didn't want to upset my readers Readers are a funny bunch. We like it. And I, I say myself, are we here? Because I'm a reader who, if I like an author, I want the same thing again and again and again in a different form. Yeah. But I want the same genre, really. And I remember reading Fanny Flagg, Fried Green Tomatoes at the Whistletop Cafe, yeah. one of my favorite books ever. And then I read Welcome to the World, Baby Girl, and was so disappointed because it was so different. It was like it was written by another author. And I've read two or three of her books since, and they're all very different. And none of them were as good, in my view, as the first one. So I don't like it when authors jump out of their boxes. All I don't mind, but they need to tell me and warn me, this is not the same as the other 10 that I've written. So Flappy is an extra one just to make my readers laugh. Let's go to the ones you have then in pipeline. process in the mm. pipeline right now, because the one that's coming out in the summer, that's set in Italy, isn't it? Yes, it's a powerful story. It's probably my most powerful story in terms of... Yeah, themes and characters and the time it's set in the war in pre-war, 30s and then the 40s in Italy up in Piedmont. And then it goes to New York, it goes back to Italy again. But it's very much that era. It's about an Italian, young Italian woman and a young Jewish man. And then, of course, the war breaks out, the Nazis come north and things get very hairy. And he has to go off into hiding and then he fights for the partisans. And the one that's coming after that is based on a true story, isn't yes. it? So a friend of mine called Simon Jacobs, who I grew up with, and our parents were great friends, still are. And I've always known his story about reincarnation. It's the most fascinating, fascinating story. And back in the 90s, he was included in a book written by a psychic lady who did past life regression. So she wrote a book about past lives. It's just extraordinary proof, really, that we have all lived before, or many of us have lived before. And I never thought of writing about it. My books are very spiritual. I deal with spirits all the time. I'm psychic myself. I grew up seeing spirits. They're very normal for me. So my books have certainly since Secrets of the Lighthouse, which was Oh, I think it's my sixth or seventh book. There's always the worry at the beginning when you're setting out as a writer. You don't want to alienate people and people think you're totally batty. And so I established myself first before I let my true colours show. And then I started writing about spirits with that book and it continued. And how has the response been for fantastic, that? Fantastic, fantastic, because I think there's a massive interest. We are all we are all curious about where we go, what life is about, what we're all here for. Those esoteric um, existential questions, we ask ourselves all the time, and especially as we get older and we lose people, we lose people very dear to us. We want to know where they are, where's their consciousness. We don't want to think that they're just cold in the ground. And how old were you when you first started seeing spirits? It was before I could articulate. Yeah, I mean, I think I just came into the world seeing them. And so, they're part and did of my it frighten reality. you at all? Yes, at it did. It did, yeah. In my early years, it frightened me. And I'd wake up, I'd hear voices, and I'd see people moving around the room, bustling, always at night when my conscious mind shut up. I thought 
I thought it was like most people think ghosts come out at night. They don't come out at night. Actually, they're around all the time. It's like the stars. You know, you can't see them in the day. And then the sun goes out. Doesn't mean they're not there. They are still there. So spirits are very much like that. And then when I got into my teens and I got interested in it, my father gave me an amazing book by Elizabeth Hike called Initiation. And that was the first book that I read about the supernatural. And it resonated so deeply with me. That was started a massive journey of exploration for me. And I read avidly everything on whether it was, you know, mad things like Atlantis and then reincarnation, life after death, spirits, ghosts, you know, you name it, I read everything. And I love, love, love it. Then I understood what it was and I understood why I was seeing these beings at night. Would they talk to you? No, they weren't interested in me. They weren't there for me. And they were nobody I knew. It was later that I started seeing people I knew. When I started meditation and then I started honing it, then I was able to, through meditation, actually really see spirits in color. Then I saw people I knew. And then it became exciting. And I absolutely love it. Oh, my God, we get on to this subject. You'll have me here all day. Do you feel what they say to you? You hear it like a voice in your head. And it's their voice. Um, yes, it is to extent their voice. I mean, the tone and everything. I mean, my sister's, I've seen my sister three times and her voice has come through to me. Absolutely. Her gravelly voice, loud and clear. And do they come to you because they choose it or do you ask? Uh, I think you can ask. You can definitely ask. I've been to mediums where they've asked. I think on the whole spirits are a thought away. And if you put a thought out there that you'd like them to come and see you, most of the time if they're around, if they're not too busy, you know, they are doing other things. They're not just sitting in a buttercup field. Um, <laughs> they, they probably do come. But I think they like to keep an eye on what's going on down here. And if this love is very strong, the bond is very strong, they'll be around a lot. I mean, I know my sister's around a lot. She's probably here right now. <laughs> Making sure I'm you... saying nice things about her. <laughs> <laughs> and can you feel, so even now, would you be able to feel it or do you have to? No, I to, couldn't. To... I'm not that good. I'm not that good. No, I do feel her at times, but I can't summon it. And I certainly wouldn't be able to do it sitting here, totally conscious of the material world around me. I'd have to sort of close my eyes and go into meditation and do it like that. In terms of Tara, I don't know whether you were happy to talk about yeah, Tara. No, talk about Tara. Um, how have you all coped? Before she died, I was always very, very confident of the spirit world and life after death and certainly not fearful at all of death. I still am not fearful of death. So when people close to me or even my readers when I went on book tours and things like that, because I write a lot about it, people would share their experiences. And so I was very quick to say, but you know, they're still with you. And I felt that was comforting. Well, after Tara died, I realized actually, no, it's not really comforting. It's not the same as having the physical presence of the person you love that you can put your arms around and say, I'm here for you. And after Tara died, I would love to have put my arms around her and said, I can help you. I can make you better. And being able to save her from dying. And I realized that just say to somebody, it's okay. They're still around. They're in spirit. I realize now that that's not enough. So when somebody loses someone they love, I respond in a different way now. It hit me like I just felt I'd gone against a brick wall at 100 miles an hour. And I felt very wounded. So I think I probably walked around for a few months very slowly, not really wanting to see anyone, just nursing something, whether it was my heart, whatever. I want. I was nursing something that needed nursing. And I felt very... I felt very different, very weird. It's like the world has sort of shifted. Everything had changed. And then I knew I'd see her at some stage in spirit. I was very surprised I didn't see her immediately. In fact, the night she died, we were reading weirdly. It was about 1.15 in the morning. And I never turned the lights out that late. And suddenly we heard a huge crash in the bathroom and rushed into the bathroom and a picture had come off the wall but it still had the hook on the picture and the nail in the wall. Oh my. So, and then when we went downstairs it, the following morning, a light had come off in my husband's office that was directly below. And then in the bedroom right below where somebody was sleeping down there, the door had slammed shut. So we thought there'd been an earthquake. So we wanted to go around and ask our neighbours, you know, what happened to you at 1.15 in the morning? Anyway, we worked out the time of her death and everything. I'm not going to bore you with those details. But 
through last emails and things like that, we realised that she must have died at that, at that moment. That moment. And I think her soul left her body. She thought of me. She came to my house in a panic. Where am I? What's happening? Probably went to see my mother too, because you just go by thought. You know, you think you're there. And I, and then I think she was probably taken off. So anyway, she didn't, so that was quite a sort of a weird experience. And I fully expected her to come and see me quite soon afterwards. And it was not until July when I was in bed in the middle of the night and I just opened my eyes and there she was sitting next to me, looking clear, it's a hologram. That's the easiest way to describe it. A hologram of her in a baby pink t-shirt, brown, shortish bob sort of hair, glowing, about 18 years old, beautiful, mischievous, funny, had the sense of her, the vibration, the energy I got from her. I forgot she ever felt like that. You know, she was very sick when she died. She'd been sick for quite a long time. And I forgot that she was ever that person. And it was really moving. And I didn't get words. I just got this, this wonderful smiley person just beaming love and happiness and joy. I think the excitement of me being able to see her and of her knowing that I knew that she was okay. And the following morning when I rang my mother to tell her, she went very quiet and said, it's very strange because we buried her in a baby pink t-shirt and no one... Oh my goodness. Mummy hadn't told anyone. She hadn't even told my father. The undertaker said, what do you want to put her in? My mother hadn't thought about it. Just went up to her old cupboard and took out a pair of tracksuit bottoms and a baby pink T-shirt. So I think Tara projected herself in a baby pink T-shirt. To confirm um, that to it confirm really was To confirm that it was her. So not for me. She knew I would know, but maybe for mum. And anyway, so that for me made such a difference. It was like a huge weight was lifted off. I knew she was okay. And from that moment on, and then I've seen her a couple of times since, I was skiing very fast down a piste and I suddenly felt her with me. I felt a rush. It's like, whoosh, she's really excited as I am skiing down this slope really fast. And I felt her with me and it was so strong. When I got to the bottom of the slope, I told my father, I still wouldn't believe it, but I know she was with me. So then we went on, when we did it again, I tried to recreate it. I couldn't, I didn't feel it at all. She wasn't there. But it's extraordinary. Yeah. So that was wonderful. So I got a great amount of comfort from that. So that's one thing that she taught me about grief, but also in my writing, it definitely changed the way I wrote. I was writing a novel at that time. I'm trying to think which one it was, but I definitely changed halfway through. I think it was The Temptation of Gracie I was writing. And when she died, my mother can tell the moment she died when I was writing that book, because she can tell from what I wrote afterwards, how it changed my writing and the way I sort of thought about things. So that she impacted me in that. She's impacted me in many ways, actually. Her death has taught me so much. And maybe the writing helps as well. Yes, because it's very cathartic. It's very cathartic. And I do write a lot about death. Um, I write about life and death is part of life. So I always have characters that have to deal with grief. And I understand it much better now. I've been through it. I think I can write much better about grief, losing someone. One of my favourite books of yours is Here and Now. At the end, I was sobbing so hard and I was, unfortunately for everyone else around me, in a public place. So I was, and it wasn't just kind of like normal sobbing. It was <laughs> sobbing. It was really embarrassing. But I was so gripped by that book. And that's a book that deals with dementia and you deal with it with such tenderness and understanding. And I was just wondering if you could tell us about how you came up to write that. I read Wendy Mitchell's book, Somebody I Used to Know. And I think it was that. She was very keen in her book that people didn't write people with dementia off because she lived with dementia and loved with dementia and actually coped. I don't know where she is now. This was about three years ago or something. But I was quite moved by that because she would get very angry seeing photographs, grainy black and white photographs of old people with their heads in their hands looking hopeless and underneath dementia, Alzheimer's or whatever. And she said, that's not me. I'm living, actually, I'm living a really good life and I've got support and I'm loving, I'm being loved and I'm living. And so I sort of wanted to get that message across. I think she moved me so much. I thought I want to help. I want to do this too. I want to let people know that actually it's not all awful 
There's a way to live with it. And so Simon Jacobs, this friend of mine who has this amazing reincarnation story, yes. his mother at that point was in a nursing home with dementia. And I got in touch with him and we actually hadn't been in touch for a while. And that almost became a catalyst for the book that we have written together, Wait For Me, about his reincarnation experience. So it's going back to me and Simon and that project we did together. But he took me to see his mother, who has now sadly passed away, in the nursing home. And it was very important for me to go there, actually, because he taught me a very interesting lesson about dementia is that if you have that disease, you live in the moment because of the way the memory and the mind works. The only place they can be is in the present moment or in the past. And sometimes it's a very distant past. And the analogy of the bookcase, which uh, people have said, Santa, you're so clever coming up with that. I love that. And I'd love to say I am clever. I thought of that. <laughs> I didn't. It's very well known and it's all over the internet. And it's very, it's a common analogy for dementia, that it's like a bookcase. The books on the top shelf are recent memories and the books on the bottom shelf are distant ones. If you shake the bookshelf, the top ones come off first. The bottom ones remain for quite a long time. So with Simon's mother, I could ask her about her childhood and she'd remember the dog, the pony, and she loved talking about her childhood. But she, because she couldn't remember yesterday or three years ago, she would then say, oh, it's lovely because um, Uncle Charlie's coming for tea today. Well, Uncle Charlie died 25 years ago. So Simon would say, how lovely. Will you send him my love when he comes? Oh, I will. What's Uncle Charlie doing? And you'd have a whole chat about Uncle Charlie. So that's so much nicer for yes. her to feel that she's... That, that Absolutely. She was having a lovely time. Not being questioned. Time. No. So... The point is that you have to make their present moment. You know, it's like Ugwe in <laughs> Kung Fu Panda <laughs> talking about the present as a gift. It's that wonderful thing of living in the moment because it's the only reality. It's the only now. Well, for Marigold, my character in Here and Now, the now is what she ends up having. That's the only thing she has. I thought that was quite an important life lesson. But I also picked up something in Wendy Mitchell's book that I thought was quite interesting. That she said one of the silver linings is that she sees her parents who are, who are dead, but she sees them walking around the room and it's very nice seeing them. She said it's something to do with the mind that... It's hallucinating. Well, I'm not so sure it's hallucinating. I think she's just tapping into her sixth sense. Most of our sixth senses lie dormant most of the time because we're not aware of them. So I used that in my novel. And Marigold has conversations with her deceased father, who is in spirit there and is with her and looking out for her. So I loved that. I liked to put that spiritual thread throughout the book. But it was quite a different book. Um, I like to challenge myself with every book that I write and do something different, still within the parameters of what I know I can do. But it's big love between Dennis and Marigold. And obviously it's a big love between her daughter, Daisy. Um, and she has her own love story too. And that's, I think, what's very clever is that you have all these different generations so that there's something that will appeal to the teenagers, there's something that will appeal to midlifers, and, and so everyone has someone to identify with. Well, which I, I have very to clever. do that. I have to do that because I have such a wide, broad span of readers. I get great granny of 95 and I get a 13-year-old writing to me. So I do like to do the generations thing because I kind of want to make them all happy. And it's funny because I've got a wonderful friend, Genevieve Gaunt, who actually has narrated, she's an actress, and she's narrated my latest book, The Distant Shores for Audible, and she's done it beautifully. But when she read Here and Now, for me, I'm in love with Marigold. Marigold yes, me too. was my favourite character because I'm, you know, I'm a 51-year-old woman, so I'm closer to her in her late 60s. Um, and yet... Genevieve said, oh, I love Daisy. I was really surprised. I was like, really? She goes, yes. She told me about all about Daisy. I was thinking that's so funny because that's the character that she identifies with. So you have this huge readership. Where is your readership outside the UK? I love the Dutch. I say the Dutch. I should say Dutch speakers because, of course, you get Belgium as well. I love them because they made a success of my books long, long, long before the UK made a success of Even my books. Even before the UK? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I was big in Holland. Talk about being a rock star. <laughs> I was a rock star in Holland long before anyone had read my books in the UK. And I went on a book tour with my daughter because she had to come with me for some reason. She was about 10. 
And we, it was the Antwerp Book Fair, and we came out of the sort of little room, and there was a queue of people that went all the way around the building, practically outside into the car park, literally hundreds of people. And I said to the lady with me, God, who are all these people for? And she said, they're for you. And my daughter, Lily, sort of <laughs> looked at me with these wide saucer eyes. It's like, oh, Mommy, you're so famous. <laughs> and But that's the funny thing about writing. So Norway, Holland, Belgium, but those territories are definitely my biggest um, in terms of sales. So you don't know what it is that makes you popular in one territory and yet another, it doesn't take off. So why is it that I'm really well known in Holland and Belgium and Norway, and yet I go to Germany and Jojo Moyes' books are everywhere. She shares an agent with me, by the way. Jojo's are everywhere and mine aren't. Do you think that's something to do with the publisher? That's an interesting thing, you see. So if you take me in the UK, my first 10 books were with Hodron Stout and the covers were so awful. They were sort of girls in pink dresses looking like they were coming down staircases in Beverly Hills mansions. Just awful. I think they probably wanted to brand me a bit like, um, oh, Penny Vincenzi. That sort of look, I so think. So do they change? So for every country, you have a different cover? Yes, you have different looks in every country, different titles in foreign oh, course, languages course, because they I'm don't work in that. the UK. I mean, that's another story, the title thing. But with the covers, and I don't believe I was well published with Hodder. I'm not saying Hodder aren't a great publisher. They do really well for certain writers, but they didn't do well for me, sadly. And after my 10th book with them, I moved to Simon & Schuster. Well, my first book with them was a number nine. It went in at number nine, the bestsellers list. I'd never been anywhere near the bestsellers list. I mean, I was so far away from the bestsellers list. I could have been on the moon. Um, so that for me was an amazing thing to actually become number nine on the bestsellers list. And then all my books after that from them went into the top five. They bought my first 10 off Hodder, repackaged them all, and they all got into the top five as well. So that goes to show that you need an alchemy between the writer and the publisher. It needs to work. Both need to work. You can't just have a brilliant publisher and a bad book, and you can't have vice versa. It's got to work on both levels. And I think my trajectory in the UK is a good example of that. So yes, I'm very, very well published in Norway, Belgium and Holland. The covers are stunning. They put all their energy and effort into my books. Um, they're passionate about them. And I'm number one in all those countries, pretty much with every book that comes out. Wow. And it's fantastic. And I'm hugely grateful. And I love, love, love going there on book tours and meeting my readers. And, and I work out there. I, you know, I'd love to say that every country in the world publishes me like that. But there are other territories that I'm very well published in Poland. They do really beautiful editions of my books. And I'm popular over there in Portugal. I do very well. And Spain with the Ombu tree was amazing. I mean, that was a massive, massive bestseller. Do you travel to every country when you're doing a book tour? I go to Holland and Belgium and Norway at the moment. I meant to be going to Poland at some stage. COVID scuppered that plan. I would love to go to Spain again. I went there once. The trouble is, I can't go everywhere because I've got to write a book. Yeah. So anything that takes me away from my desk isn't easy for me. I get a bit twitchy. Although now my children are grown up, they're at university, I can. Before, I couldn't really leave the children. I mean, I've had America, I'm relaunching now in America because going back to the titles, they changed the titles of my novels, which then my readers get upset because they buy the new book thinking it's a new edition. Because now but it's the same yes, one. Yes, it's the same one. So then they get upset. I spent 12 pounds on your book and I've read it. It's got a different title. And then they get cross with me. And now I've just put my foot down. I'm not going to be published in America again unless they stick to my titles. I don't need to be published in America. I'm not greedy. I'm very happy with what I've got. I think happiness comes from sometimes accepting where you are and not craving for something that you can't have. So yes, if I end up being a success in America, and I think my fantastic Simon Schuster Canadian publisher, I'm publishing with Simon & Schuster in the UK as well. I think they're going to publish me in America. If they do and I become a success in America, wonderful. But I'm not craving it or wishing that it was so. Although I have had some hilarious stories. I sat next to the Duke of Edinburgh at a dinner at Windsor Castle. Seabag and I were invited for what they call a dine and stay. And he, Seabag was the guest and I was his plus one. But I ended up sitting next to the Duke of Edinburgh, which was Absolutely amazing. Now he's sadly passed away. I'm 
very honoured that I got the chance to meet him. But we started off having a sort of small talk conversation and I was having quite a bit of trouble actually because I wanted to be entertaining, but I think I was just saying the most stupid things. He was looking <laughs> at me. You were no, no, I there. really was. I was like saying, oh, it's so lovely to be in this beautiful castle. I, I can't believe I'll find my way back to my room. And he said, well, it's just a corridor that goes up and down. <laughs> and I said, but, I, but how will I find my door? It's got your name on it, hasn't it? So I was thinking, Sandy, you're just saying the most stupid things. So then he saved me by saying, well, you're a writer, aren't you? And then I said, oh, and I've had some funny book tours. And then I launched into my stories of being in somewhere Midwest America and going to this big borders book shop that was huge, like a warehouse. And they had this huge room to the side of it where they had a podium and hundreds of seats and people could give talks and things. And as we were walking through the shop, I'm not going to do the American accent. I would, but as this is a podcast, <laughs> I'm not going to embarrass myself by doing a very bad American accent. But the lady was saying, you know, we were so lucky because last week we had Isabella Allende and it was 400 people standing room only. She was so popular that actually she's going to come back in a month because there are another 400 people that want to see her. And I was thinking, well, this is great, you know, and we get to the room <laughs> and there's no one there at all except a man in a baseball cap reading a book that isn't mine sitting in the back row. And I've look around and there's the podium and all my books piled up and a big poster of me. And so I say to her, so what time am I on? And she goes, well, looks at my watch and says, well, like now. It's like, there's no one oh, no. here. So I awful. run up to the guy with the baseball cap and I fall on him very gratefully say, you're my only fan. He looks at me really <laughs> embarrassed and says, actually, I'm really sorry. I'm just waiting for my wife and kids to finish shopping. Oh. And he'd just taken a pew. <laughs> so he wasn't even there for me. No one was there for me. Anyway, the Duke of Edinburgh thought those stories were very funny and I gave him a good laugh. You can never really feel too pleased with yourself, which is a good thing. It also means that every time I write a book, I think, OK, what do my readers want? And after the Deverell Chronicles, which were Ireland... And that was a trilogy. It turned into five. Oh, it turned into five? Yes, because it was The it was Secret more. Hours, then The Distant Shores, which is out now. And actually, I'm writing number six now. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yes, this one is... Eight, this is the 1860s. So it's going back to the Devils in the 1860s. So I wasn't going to do it. I really, really promise, promise I wasn't. I, <laughs> I had my idea and it wasn't anything to do with the Devils. And then I thought, where shall I set it? It's got to be Ireland because of the sort of spiritual nature of the book. It's got to be Ireland. And then I thought, well, I can't go and just make up another place. So let's use Ballina Kelly. Oh, but Castle Devils just over the hill. So I thought, <laughs> okay, well, let's have the Devils being part of it. So now the Devils are a big part of it. But it's the main character is not a Devil. But it's a devil-related book. Anyway, after the Devils, I got quite a few emails saying, oh, would you write one in Italy again? So then I thought, OK. Then I wrote the one for next year. But I had my readers in mind. So I do now think of my readers. Having met so many of them, I know what they like. Because I, I get a lot of emails um, and people write to me and say, I really love this in your book or that in your book. And then I think, OK, well, I'll give you a bit more of that then. And sometimes I put my fans' names in my books. I have a fan in America called Dorothy. She is so sweet and we email each other a lot. And so in The Distant Shores, the one that's out now, I named a character in her honour. J.K. Rowling, she must have figured out that Snape was a certain way in book seven, so she must have plotted it all out. And I listened to an interview that P.D. James did and she said that she always starts with a place. And so that's really interesting for your doing your trilogy that's now turned into four and five and now going to be six as well. It, maybe it's different for every book, but how do you start? I always start with a place and say, where do I want to base it? I sometimes start with a scene. The one that I'm writing now, I just was listening to music and I saw a woman standing on the end of a pier by a lake and that gave me my whole story. So weirdly, something can trigger an idea like that. An article in newspapers can trigger an idea. In terms of planning, with the one I'm doing now, I know the beginning, I know the twist in the middle, and I know probably know the ending, although that might change. What I'm going to do in the middle, <laughs> I have no idea. I have no idea. It's a little scary because I don't plan. The trilogy... I didn't plan. I mean, it sounds a bit mad now, but as soon as I started writing the first book, 
I then saw how it can potentially go to book two and book three. And in fact, I sort of knew how the whole thing was going to wind up in the end, but I didn't know how I was going to get there. And the trouble with that is when you don't plan, you can get yourself into a bit of a pickle because you write book one, that's all hunky-dory. Then you get to book two, but there are certain things in book one, which means you can't do things in book two because it's set in stone in book one. So it's kind of like, oh, that's so annoying. If I'd known I was going to do this, I would have changed that. So unlike J.K. Rowling, who brilliantly plans everything down to literally the colour of the buttons on their shirts, so she knows that in book six, that button's going to be significant. Yeah. I don't do that. And I wish I had the ability, but actually I don't. I really can't do that. If you told me now to tell you a story, I couldn't tell you a story. I could only tell you a story if I start the story and then it comes to me as I'm telling it. Because then I think, well, that character is this way because of what happened to her when she was a child. So that's why she doesn't like that person because it reminds her of that. And then, the, and then you start getting into the characters and then you start really building all the characters and their histories and what makes them the way they are. And, and that's really fun. But sometimes you don't even really know what you're doing until the end of the book when you think, oh, well, that's why she became the person she did because her mother was like that. And then you get all the all the threads that come together, but you don't really know why you're doing it at the time. It just feels right. So I think I write instinctively. And then at the end, it kind of miraculously comes together. And I think I don't know how I did that. It just happened. So I do trust that there's a bigger part of me that I'm not conscious of that works it all out for me and just guides me because every book sort of does kind of work out without me really having to plan very much. It just happens. I don't know how. Before we finish, I want to talk talk about Rabbits because that's four books you've written with your husband, Simon. How was that writing with him? Both are fantastic writers in totally different spaces. We brought something different, each of us, to the table, which was good. So he's a historian. He's brilliant at plotting. So where I'm a terrible plotter until I get into the story, he can do it cold. So he can sit down and work everything out. Also, he's slightly off the wall, whereas I'm, certainly when it comes to children's books, I'm very much in the box of Wind in the Willows, Grey Rabbit, Winnie the Pooh, all those sort of stories. And I think I find it quite hard to get out of that, whereas he's just a little bit batty and off the wall, which when you're plotting these rabbit stories and, you know, and I'm thinking, well, where do the rats see? Is it basically paparazzi is the king of this mafia style group of rats such who, a great name who such use the internet name. to embarrass and destabilize the monarchy and they live the rabbits the royal rabbits of london live under buckingham palace and protect the royal family but they go right back to camelot when they were the rabbits of the round table so you've got that history that was seabag all the camelot thing was seabag so he's very good at all of that when we were thinking about the ratsies and where they lived i was thinking under the bank of england and dripping grimy slimy because that's what i've grown up with. He said, no, no, no. They live at the top of the shard. They have pristine. I mean, we're talking the most amazing technology, the latest smartphones, yeah. you know, and then they've got the this media. Am- yes, thing. media plays. And then they've got this amazing gym with all these incredible instruments, but that's their talk. They, they're fat and lazy. They don't want to exercise. So that's where they torture ratsies who don't behave properly. They have to go on the running machine. You know, so he came up with these rather funny off the wall And very modern. Exactly. So, you know, and then we've got the minks of the Kremlin. So every country has their own sort of gangsters, I suppose. Um, And we had a lot of fun creating all of them. And then you've got the American rabbits. They're rotus as opposed to potus. So, (laughs) you know, that's all rather fun. So we created our world, which was really amusing. But I think because um, Seabag had never written children's books before, and neither had I, although I started out writing children's books when I was a child. We were neither of us experts. So if I had to help him write a history book, I'd step on his toes and he would not like advice. Likewise with me and my books, I wouldn't want him getting involved and poking his nose into my novels. But because we were both coming to the children's book, it was a neutral territory for both of us. So neither of us had authority. So we were open to listen to each other's ideas. And we it really worked actually doing it together. I couldn't have done it without him. He couldn't have done it without me. It really is a you know, 50-50 combined effort. And it was bought by Fox to make into an animated movie. Then Disney took over Fox. So now it's a Disney project because Fox has been swallowed up by Disney. So it's happening. And I think we're probably looking at 2024 Easter for 
the release date. But that will be really fun to see our rabbits hopping about on the screen that in a sort of CGI so movie. That will be so much fun. I read it to the children and it's very different, I would imagine, writing for children because you have to strip out all the description. Was that harder? Yeah, much harder. I mean, we've stopped at four. If it had been a piece of cake, I would have insisted that Seabag and I continue. We would have written 20 because we're not short of ideas. But it's so much hard work and the editing process is so long because we need guidance. And we had the most wonderful editor at Simon & Schuster who really knew what she wanted in our books. And I think she brought the best out in us. But it meant lots and lots of rewrites. There are loads of things that you just don't think about. Your language you have to think about because they're 7 to 11-year-olds. You know, we had our foxes who live under 10 Downing Street at the Fox Club because they look after the Prime Minister. So STBT, Sharp Tooth, Bushy Tail, our main character, Fox, <laughs> who's very cool and drives a Harley Davidson. He had Bailey's Irish Cream. We thought that would be perfect. Well, of course, you can't have a character drinking alcohol. No, You can't have them all smoking cigars either. No. You know, so you have to then have something that's fun, but has the same energy. We've had lovely letters from children and they they do little stories about the rabbits and draw pictures. But that's so rewarding as well that you give somebody else so much pleasure. Yeah, it is actually. I think writing for children is lovely. It's always what I wanted to do actually. When I was a teenager myself, I was writing children's books for nephews and nieces and I didn't have nephews and nieces and cousins, you know, for kids basically that I knew. So it's lovely to have you know, had a few published. It's also fun to do something else. You know, I've been writing a big book a year for the last 25 years. 27 books. Yeah, I've actually written more because the two that are in the pipeline, I've got another flappy, got Wait For Me, almost 30, I think now. If you count the ones that are in the pipeline, haven't come out yet. So it's a lot of books, but it's fun to try something new occasionally and just jazz it up a bit. In some of the other podcasts that I've done, we've talked about you know, we have a handful only of really, really high moments. Could you describe a moment like that? Probably a telephone call from Joe Frank saying, hi, it's Joe, read your book, I've loved it, really like to represent you. I think getting an agent is a massive deal because once you've got an agent, you are pretty likely to get a publisher. I think getting a getting a deal, I think Hodder and Stout, and it was um, a bidding war between them and another two, and when Joe Frank rang up and said, you know, the bidding's finished and Hodder and Stoughton have bought your book and everything, that, and it was more money than I had ever expected. And it was a two book deal. That I think was a massive moment. Well, I'm going to throw just some questions at you before I let you go. Your most important daily habit? Oh, I think it's doing Wim Hof. Oh, it's I think Wim. my Wim Hof breathing, yeah, my Wim Hof breathing, I should do a cold shower afterwards. And I did at the beginning last year in lockdown. I had that cold shower in the morning for two minutes and I was on a high every day. It was amazing. But that doesn't last. You kind of get used to the cold showers and you, you still you feel great, but you don't get that original high, which I think is why people like you go and throw yourself on through the ice and end up sort of swimming around in icy lakes because then you do get that high again. And I'm not sure whether you get that high because it's just so nice that it stopped, that you still you come out. <laughs> I know. It's <laughs> such, such a relief. Be. It's such a relief when you're finally <laughs> yeah, warming up. So yes, I think my Wim Hof breathing, I lie in bed and I do that 15 minutes in the morning. I love that. It might have something to do with this very sexy voice, of course. I, think, I still think we should go and see him sometime. Okay. What about a most embarrassing moment that you can think of? Oh, I've had so many embarrassing moments. Um, I was at a book launch and this woman had a very low cut dress on and a massive cleavage. It was really quite impressive. And she was charming and we were chatting away and we were eating the nibbles and drinking champagne. And I leaned over because I saw that there was a nut down her cleavage. And I said, I said, by the way, you've got a pistachio (laughs) stuck down your cleavage. She says, oh no, it's a mole. Oh. (laughs) So how do you get out of that? Oh, I said, well, okay, well, I won't be burrowing in there then. (laughs) Very embarrassing. I must have just laughed it off, probably gone puce in the face, 
that was probably a hot flush as well. Yeah, that sort of thing though happens to me quite a lot. I do have another embarrassing, I was at a party at Hartford Street and we were all told to go downstairs. And it was one of these sort of pre-BAFTA parties, so everybody was famous except us. And I went downstairs being dutiful, and I was one of the only people down there. And there was a man at the bar, and I thought I'll go and sit and have a drink while everybody else comes down. And the man turned around, and it was Ray Fiennes. Oh. And always been a fan of Ray Fiennes. Yes. Not only is he devilishly handsome, but he's a brilliant actor, and he's, you know, obviously, he's he's wonderful. So I was very excited to sort of, and he said, do you want to come and join me? And so I sat on the stool and crossed my legs and gave him a look and decided to chat. <laughs> and then I wittered on. <laughs> no, I, sure I did. I felt like Rachel in Friends, where everything I said was more stupid than the thing before, and he was just looking at me with this rather sort of bemused <laughs> look on his face as I asked him the most ridiculous questions, came out with the most appalling sort of gauche comments and felt that I was just sinking <laughs> into the ground in quicksand and wanted the ground to just swallow me up and was desperate for somebody to come and rescue me because I thought, I just, this is just so <laughs> embarrassing. It was one of those evenings where you really want to wake up and it was a horrible nightmare. But anyway, so that was my Ray Fiennes experience. Yeah, well, I did that with Liam Neeson. Oh, I went up to him. Too. Well, I went up to him in the bar because I saw him and I thought I'm going to just be brave. And I was so awful and embarrassing with what I said and didn't say. And then I couldn't hear what he was saying. And I sort of crawled back to my seat five minutes later. I wish I hadn't bothered. You I'm sure, sure we're not related. Yeah, I'm sure that he'd wished that I hadn't bothered as well. <laughs> If there was someone that you could have dated and not been embarrassing with, um, who would it have been? Oh, I'm quite weird, though. My crush, massive crush, is Javier Bardem. Oh, so, yes. No, yeah, if I could have the 13th hour, which then you could do whatever you liked in that 13th hour and then wake up in the morning and it disappeared. I would definitely like to go on a very romantic date with Javier Bardem. I think he's delicious. I would love to, weirdly, I really fancy Larry David. Who's Larry? I don't even know who Larry <gasps> David is. Oh, he's really funny. He's a com comedic writer. He wrote Seinfeld. Oh, he has his okay. own show called Curb Your Enthusiasm. He must be in his 70s now. He's hilarious. He's Jewish. And I've always loved Jewish men. I married a Jewish man. Love Jewish men. He's just fabulous. I love him. So um, I'd love to go on a date with him. But it's not so much that I fancy him. I just love him. I just love to sit and have dinner with him. He'd be very entertaining. Yeah, he'd be just so entertaining. And if there's one piece of advice you could give to aspiring writers, what would that be? I think believe in yourself and don't give up because everyone has their own unique voice. Don't try to emulate other people. Don't try to fit into a certain market. If a thriller is popular right now and everybody's writing Gone Girl, Mark two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Don't, if you, if you want, that's not your comfort zone. That's not what you want to write. You do what you want to write. You be the trailblazer. Maybe everybody will then be copying you. So that's the advice I think is be you, be unique, be brave. Don't think about your reader. Don't go back and polish, polish, polish. Keep going, get the book written, then get it right. Take advice from someone that you admire and trust, but Follow the advice if you feel that it's the right advice. It's ultimately, it's your book, your voice, and it's going to be uniquely you and love what you do. When you're writing and you're not feeling that love and you're feeling it's an effort, it's like walking through concrete, change tack, go back, rewrite. Because if you're not feeling it, if you're not on a wave of inspiration and loving it and enjoying it and taking pleasure from it, then you're not inspired and then it's not going to work. And for our sons and daughters, not about writing, but if there was just one thing that you could tell them, perhaps that you would tell a younger Santa if you were doing it all again, what would that be? Nobody's looking at you. Do you know why? That's a really because good as a thing. as a kid, you are so self conscious. You walk into a room and you think everyone's looking at me. Yeah. If I get up now and I walk to the loo, everyone's going to look at me. How do I look in my dress? What does everybody think of me? Is my strap falling down? Is my bra showing? Is my makeup okay? Is my hair okay? What's everyone thinking of me? No one's thinking of you. No one's looking at you. 
because they're all so busy thinking of themselves themselves, like you are. Yeah. So I think that's a piece of advice I would give because now as a 51 year old, I know no one's looking at me so I can do anything. I walk, I go wherever I want. I talk to whoever I want. I, I'm not self-conscious. I have no self-consciousness at all. I, because I know no one's looking at me, but when you're 15, 16, you think everyone's looking at you and judging you and criticizing you and it's terrifying. And it really holds you back. Yes. Because you can't be you. No, you can't be you because you're terrified. Nobody's interested. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's what I'd true. say. Nobody's looking at you. Very, very good advice. Now, we haven't mentioned your gorgeous children. And I can say they're gorgeous because I know them. If you had a perfect day with your children, what would it be? Where would oh, you go? Where would you good eat? Good question. Um, off, off the top of my head, I would say cloisters in Switzerland, but then my husband doesn't ski and that'd be leaving him out. So I would say Italy. I think we'd be somewhere in Italy at a hotel like Verdura, which is Rocco Forte's gorgeous hotel in Sicily, where we love going. And we'd be, it would be a meal because no one loves eating more than my family. So the four of us would be at a table on the seafront, beautiful day, having spent all morning on the beach, having spaghetti, and a big glass of wine, and Seabag would be telling his hilarious stories. We'd all be roaring with laughter, and we'd just be having a lovely time because we always do the four of us together. And I think we'd be there because we all love Italy. We all love the Italian food. We like being together. That's really great. Hey, Santa, thank you so much for talking to me today. Before you go, I just want to quote you back to you because I found this on your website and I just think it is so, it's such a oh, brilliant thing that you say. You were very wise. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you were. You say, above all, my novels are about love, not just romantic love, but love with a capital L because when you boil life down to its essence, love is what you'll find. I hope to sweep you away, make you laugh and cry in equal measure, but most of all, make it possible for you to escape for a while. And I think that's absolutely wonderful. But you manage that time and time again, and it flows through your books and it flows through you and us as your friends can feel that warmth and generosity and kindness that you have in spades. Oh, I love you. (laughs) Why didn't Liam need some sort of sweep you off your feet? If you'd seen me, you would have known why he didn't. (laughs) He kicked me into the curb. (laughs) But thank you. Thank you for having me. 